Rock Talk with Dominic Forbes. This week it's a special on the babies. Wally Stoker, Tony Brock, Joey Sykes and John Bisher. First of all, guitarist Wally Stoker. I was playing in a little band and we were doing a few pubs and that, but I was looking for something a little more sort of enticing. So I used to get the melody maker every week and I spotted this ad and it just simply said guitar player needed for rock band and it said had the word wages. They scheduled an audition for me. They were rehearsing in uh, on Tooley Street right there by Tower Bridge. And uh, I walked in and John Waite was there, Tony Brock was there, and Michael Corby. We fiddled around a bit and played some other things, some blues, and at the end of the evening, it was, we'll give you a call and let you know, and so off I went. And as I put the key in the front door, I could hear the phone ringing, and it's John Waite, and he said to me, Well, we've had a discussion. The job is yours if you want it. That was the start for me. We kind of took off from there. Was success very quick to come? It was once we got to the States. We had finally got our record deal, went up to Canada, Toronto, and recorded our first album with Bob Ezrin. Then they released the first single from that, If You've Got the Time had like a promotional tour in the States and eventually ended up moving over here. That's when things started to happen for us. We were on TV shows like Dick Clark's American Bandstand and the Midnight Special and Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. Being on those kind of shows, I I think that's when we started to realize that things were really starting to take off for us. So what did success mean to the band? How did it affect you all? We felt like we were rewarded the way that we kind of wanted to be. It was certainly a goal that we were aiming for, and we felt that we had made an impact with our own sound and our own material, and it was being accepted nationwide. Going out and touring with bands that were a notch above us, but we were getting there, also helped. You know, we've made a lot of friends, and felt like we were part of that rock and roll family that was around at that time. Did it bother you being almost mobbed when you went to the States, but being able to walk completely unrecognised in your home country? In the early days, I I would come back to to London quite a bit. But as the years went on, um, my trips became less frequent. In answer to your question, no, it didn't bother me at all. <laughs> How long did the success last for? We changed the lineup on the third album. Michael Corby departed. At the time, John Waite was playing bass. He said, well, you know what? If we can look for a keyboard player that can play guitar like Michael, to be honest with you, I'd like to step away from the bass and just sing. While we're auditioning keyboard players, let's look for a bass player too. We finished the third album as a three-piece. It was time to go out and promote that. That's when we auditioned and found Jonathan Kane and Ricky Phillips. Went out and toured with Alice Cooper on the Head First Tour. So that was like the second lineup of the band. And in the end of 1980, I think it was, we were out touring with Journey. When that was over, we went and did about five or six weeks of our own shows. And then it all sort of came to a grinding halt. This week on Rock Talk, it's a baby special talking to Wally Stoker. John wasn't really into the band situation anymore. He was looking more sort of forward to more of a solo type career. And I would always try and talk him out of it and tell him that, you know, we don't need to break up the band for him to do a solo career. But that's basically what happened. It all came to an end and everybody sort of went their own way. We uh, reformed the band, I guess, about four years ago now. Yeah, 2013, I have it down that you um, actually came back together around with the band. Tony called me. Through the years, we had contacted John Wade if he was interested in maybe uh, getting back together again with Tony and myself. He always declined the offer and said he was happy with his solo career and time would go by and we'd hit him up again and same response so in the end tony called me and said you know would you be interested 
in reforming the band if we can find a replacement for John Way. He said, I'm not going to do it without you. If you're not interested, he said, I'll just leave it alone and I'll get on with what I'm doing. But I said to him, no, I'm, I'm committed. If we can find the right singer, let's give it another shot, you know. So uh, let's talk about the right singer then, your your vocalist, John. John who, Bizarre. Yeah, is there something with yeah, the babies always having a singer who can also play the bass? I guess at the time, it was like, if we can keep it down, four-piece lineup, we won't need to pay a fifth member just to play the bass. We hit the jackpot because not only could he sing, he could play bass too. Now, it can't be easy for him because him fronting the babies, he knew from the start he would be compared instantly to John Waite. Oh, yeah. I mean, he he knew that and we knew that. But John's very humble and he's a big fan of John Waite anyway. Been a big fan of the babies long before we ever met John Bazaar. We never wanted to lose that babies sound. Our approach is if it sounds good on the track, then we keep it in. As far as this new album, I'll have some of that. The approach was let's keep it raw, let's keep it basic. This is Rock Talk and it's a baby special. Next up, following on from Wally Stoker, is second guitarist Joey Sykes. Tell me about your first success, Boys Town. Boys Town was a a New Jersey, New York band. We were managed by the club owners of the famous China Club. One thing led to another and somehow managed an English deal with an EMI company. And we had a single out called Way of the World, you know, never quite broke in the States and never quite reached what we all thought it was going to be. But uh, we spent a couple of months in England and it was amazing. After Boys Town, how long was it before you joined up with Coward, the band Coward? We got a record deal in 96. It, that, that one was pretty much instantaneously. Me and the singer started the band late 95, I think, and then we got a, a huge record deal in like 96 so that that happened like overnight almost what happened we made a record with jerry finn he had just come off of producing green day it was great it was a great time the record was amazing we came out and at the same time they signed third eye blind the way record companies go is pretty much one band at a time as far as putting the big money behind they always just gravitate towards whatever band is you know making the most noise they got a lot of the attention What do you do between then and joining the babies? I wrote a lot. I, I still do. I write a lot of songs. I, I had a couple of different publishing deals, and I write for different artists and myself and film and TV. I've had maybe about 50 or so song placements in, in TV shows and a couple of movies. And that was originally how I was brought into the baby situation. I heard that they were going to started up again and someone uh, brought me in to write some songs in the beginning before I was even in the band. I was basically writing songs. What did the babies mean to you before you joined? I started really, really early in my, in my career. Like I, I, my mom had all these great records. So I used to have a listen at all of her, her collection. And in my neighborhood growing up in Long Island, there was a lot of older kids. I was like a guitar player, like a young kind of like prodigy guitar player. So that probably made me ex- more accepted than I would have been just as as a little kid, you know. Between my mom and my older friends in the neighborhood, they had all these records and Babies was one of those bands. So I, I already knew about the Babies at a, at a really young age. Fast forward however long later to meeting Wally Stocker and Tony Brock and writing for the the album is pretty crazy. You were involved with the creation of the track, Not Ready to Say Goodbye. Yes, that's that was the first thing that I did. I, that was the song that I brought in. You already had that. You'd already had the basis of that song in your mind. The first single that we released off the record was a song called I See You There. Mm-hmm. That one I had already completed. So that one was a song that I had a couple of years ago before I even met them. Not Ready was when they brought me in to write. That was the one I, I wrote when they when they asked me to, you know, join joined the band and I, and I had brought in the music to that just kind of collaborated on finishing it up and stuff. Your mother must have been thrilled when you um, joined the babies, considering how you <laughs> described her um, record collection. Yeah, exactly. She was. It's, it's, it's trippy to anyone who knows me. This week is a special on the babies and in a moment I'll be speaking to vocalist John Bisher and guitarist Tony Brock. 
Rock Talk with Dominic Ford. Continuing with our baby special, next up it's guitarist Tony Brock. You have been a professional musician since the age of 15, and apart from the babies, your credentials are quite impressive, aren't they? Um, who are the, a few of the other musicians you played with? Oh, I've been a lucky boy. I got my first record deal when uh, with, I don't know if you remember, uh, Emerson Lake and Palmer. Of course. Uh, well, Greg Lake. Uh, produced that and we had our first record deal with Harvest and and then from there well after that band broke up I went to a band called Strider and then the babies I don't know where the silly name came up from I think we might have had too many to drink or something it wasn't your idea then you're not taking credit for that (laughs) the next day it stuck with us This week on Rock Talk, it's a baby special. Currently, I'm talking to their guitarist, Tony Brock. I felt we weren't finished. We had a lot more in us. Wally and I kept riding after the babies split up. I moved from the babies to uh, Eddie Money for six months and then Rod Stewart for 12 years. You produced the new Babies album. Do you have any other experience with producing records? We've been lucky enough to have some of the best producers in the world with the babies and all the other stuff we done and I've just been watching and watching and picking up all the ideas I can because I knew at one point that's what I wanted to do. My first attempt was with Keith Urban. That sort of seemed to get his career going. And then I went with to Jimmy Barnes. The album I was lucky enough to produce, uh, I kept it sounding like the babies and giving it that Simon Kirk, John Bonham sound. we Basically, we are still a rock and roll band, but we like melody, so that's where our heads came from, and the two seem to work together. In the later days of the babies, were there less smiles at each other then? Yes. Would you agree with John Waite's statement then that it always was yours and Wally's band? After I thought about it, I thought, uh, well, it is. It, Wally and I was the one who had the sound. Wally's got that poor Kossoff sort of slickness to him. I have my own sound too. Your own, you know, every band's got the, with the drummer, they have their own groove. As far as I'm concerned, when you change a drummer, you're changing the band sound and, and groove. Now that John Waite is no longer with you and he took his lyrics with him, who writes the lyrics? Our new singer, John Pasaha, he's ended up being wonderful and taking Waite's job and making it his own as well. And he's taken over the lyrical side of it. One of my favourite baby songs is Every Time I Think of You, but the lyrics to it are atrocious, honestly. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> we had a rough time with that one. What's next for the babies? Where do you see the babies going in future? We're trying to get more and more shows, obviously. And the, the more we play together, the tighter we are. One of the things that I think I'm really proud of, when we put um, Head First together, that and Midnight Rendezvous and everywhere, you can still to this day go into a club and a top 20 band will be playing it. That makes you feel really good. Thank you to Tony Brock. We conclude this special on the babies with their lead vocalist, John Pasaha. Probably the hardest job in the babies was to replace John Waite. That is quite an awesome prospect of going in there with the thought, how do you replace him? What's your mindset? The mindset as far as replacing John, I, I try not to look at it from that standpoint you know I've, I've looked at it really from the point of really we're back on our feet again pardon the pun in, in getting these songs back out there's going to be a lot of comparison there's going to be a lot of this isn't John Waite you know blah 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 you know I try not to pay much attention to it I just try to do the best that I can bringing these songs forward I've been a huge fan of the babies since the Broken Heart album back in the day so I'm, I'm here, I'm tickled pink to be able to be the guy that's singing this, and I, I have a great time doing it. I believe I cut my teeth on album-oriented rock. 
you know, back in the day before it was even really coined. I've had a, a good string of luck to be able to play with some really good people. And, you know, in the past couple of years since being in the babies, that list has even grown since then. So, you know, it's given a little bit of notoriety and it's certainly given me a little bit of a, a pseudo pedigree, if you will, to be able to play with, you know, I mean, lately I've been doing some shows with Derek St. Holmes and Greg Raleigh and Mark Rivera, who plays with Billy Joel. And we kind of do these little all-star events either through corporate parties or benefits and, and put the these types of groups together and have a good time with that as well. So how have the fans reacted to you? It's been very positive. You know, at the very beginning, you had a lot of the people that would state that, you know, it's not John Waite. We need to, you know, move on from there. It's more of a tribute type of an act. But, you know, I like to think that I do the songs justice. I sing virtually not lick for lick what John sang, but pretty doggone close. I want to stay true to the sound. I want to stay true to the vibe. I'm not sure if John was a bass player by necessity back in the day. I've always been a bass player by necessity in the groups that I've been in. I mean, I consider myself a vocalist first, and I'm an adequate rock bass player. I certainly, you know, when I, when I went through the audition process with Tony, the first time we met, he said, well, I, you know, I understand that you play bass. And I'm like, Tony, that was a while back when I fronted a band and played bass. You know, I'm, I'm a stock. Give me the four. And, I, and I'm good. And he goes, well, have you listened to the baby songs? And I said, absolutely, Tony. I could probably play most of them. And he said, well, they're not too hard. They're really pocket stuff. Go ahead and give it a shot. And I was very, very happy to find that I had the ability. And it kind of crept along. And I find myself a better bass player 20 years after the fact than back when I played, you know, in the 80s and 90s. I've been able to bring that forward. <laughs> The story behind the album, we thought we had about four months to go get the thing done. And Wally had been living out in Florida, and we just finished a series of shows, shipped him back so he could move himself and his family back here so we could get ready and get on with the record. We went and socialized, I don't know, maybe some 50 songs, a bunch of songs that we chose that came off of Tony and Wally's cassette tapes. When the babies broke up in 81, they kind of stayed together and went into Tony's studio and just started putting down snippets, narrowed it down to 30, got it down to 20, and figured there were 16 that we were going to track. And of the 16, we ended up fully tracking 14 tunes, and literally half of those tunes were... Tony and Wally uh, instrumentals that either myself or Joey put lyric to. Joey brought in a good chunk, and then I brought in a couple others. And so they were not a real organic creation of the record. It was all bring in an element, see if we all like it, and stick. Many thanks to the members of the Babies for joining me this week. Their current album, I'll Have Some of That, is out now. For more information on Rock Talk, go to the website, dominicforbes.org. Next week, Gary Sharone from Extreme. I'm Dominic Forbes. This has been Rock Talk.